I'm Whitney Casey, former journalist for CNN and now current tech entrepreneur. Definitely big switch from journalism to tech. Um, the founder and CEO of Finery, which is the world's first operating system. This is not a panel about Finery either, but it is a panel about women in fashion and why we aren't here. So I'm just gonna set the landscape a little bit before we get to the, Brooklyn. Anyway, no, before we get to the rest of our panel. Um, this is kind of interesting. I feel like I'm just talking to my friends here. So if you, if you look at these three things, Cinderella, her glass slipper, kind of sort of interesting, like the first thing when we're young, we get to see a glass slipper. This is like our gateway to fashion and her gateway to marriage. Not the best. Um, the next thing I'm showing you right here is a bra. That was also created by a woman, just like the stiletto that was created by a woman, and then Wonder Woman, which was actually a character that was created by a man, but then brought to life by Linda Carter. So you're gonna learn what all three of these things have in common by the end of this. I know they're a very random assortment of things, but they do actually all have something in common, and um, you probably already have guessed what that is, but anyway, we're gonna get to it. Um, also, we have slido.com that we wanted to just talk about quickly. If you guys wanna have answer que ask questions to us at the end of the panel, you can, but you wanna go to slido.com and do hashtag South by Southwest. So you can ask our panelists awesome questions, because I know you probably have millions of them. Um, anyway, let's get the panel up here and let's get this started. So I wanna start with Jessie Draper. I don't know where they're coming out of, so. But Jessie Draper is a pretty unbelievable woman. I met her recently. Um, girlfriend has a family full of venture capitalists, and she's the first one to sort of bust out of the realm and be the first female in her family to do this. She also only invests in women, so it's kind of amazing. Her portfolio is full of women success stories, um, including like this amazing candy company that I love, Sugarfina. So Jesse, come out here, wherever you are, come out, come out. And then the next person we have is Kay Koplovitz. And Kay is pretty amazing too. Just, you know, just started a small network. First woman only ever to start a network. USA Networks, just a small one. Um, anyway, Kay's been helping women entrepreneurs for a very long time, and she's gonna help us all sort of understand the landscape of why women are not more involved in the things that they wear and own, um, like our clothes. Anyway, uh, Kay, come on out here. She has an amazing book out. Also, Been There, Run That. How awesome is that? Woo! Kay Koplovitz. Whoa. Everybody, this massive room. I can't hear for the applause. And then finally, my dear friend and also my business partner, she is making this amazing transition from being a supermodel and actress and now a tech entrepreneur. It's pretty exciting. So Brooklyn Decker, come on out here. Woo! Amazing. Thanks, friends. Thanks, guys. Sorry. I'm going to go this way. I'm just I was told around. to sit here. Don't We're you good. kind of feel silly with the mics on and We're there's so few people? So we, we could just talk to you without talk to you. Yeah, I know. microphones. Just so, the first thing I kind of wanted This is to, so intimate. Yeah, it is. Hi, guys. Hey. I, w I wanted to like jump right into the fact that I th the reason why Brooklyn and I, when we saw this fact, we were like, oh, wait a minute. This is insane. Out of these Fortune 500 companies, the 15 that are actually fashion companies, there are, none of them are run by women. And I just thought that is so odd, because here we are, 70 to 80 percent of the consumers, we buy everything, everything in fashion, and none of the fashion companies that are in the Fortune 500 are run by women. It seems weird because we always hear about Tory Burch, Diane von Furstenberg, all of these people, like red herrings people. They're amazingly successful women, they're not Fortune 500 companies, and the Zaras of the world, the H&Ms of the world, these companies are making billions, and women are in them, but they're not running them. So I wanted to sort of talk with Kay about that because I thought she, as someone, I actually use media as a really great sort of barometer for how fashion runs. Fashion's a boys club, Me media is a boys club. Kay is the first one to start um, a network as a woman. So why is fashion not up there too? Well, I, honestly, I think fashion, uh, the designers, the people driving the product and everything is basically, women are driving that part of the business, but they're not driving the, you know, the 
P&L and so forth in, in the business. And I think a lot of that came out of, you know, uh, the Schmata district uh, in Manhattan uh, many, many years ago uh, when people were, you know, doing the production, they were doing the, you know, the inventory control and that sort of thing. And I think the fashion side and the design side and the marketing side appealed to women a lot more, to be honest with you. I think that's really how it evolved. So those big companies, because they are large Fortune 500 companies, are still basically still run by men. And we have a lot of brands that are run by women, but they're not Fortune 500 brands. So you named some of them. But we'll get into it. I think that in coming generations, it's going to change because I think really how fashion and retail businesses are coming to market is changing very dramatically. But I think that's how business started. I mean, I was on the board of Liz Claiborne when Liz actually was the head of it and was the first woman to take a, a fashion company public. So we did have a woman and, mm -hmm. and actually the first one to go public as a fashion and retail business. So, but of course she retired a number of, quite a number of years ago. I completely agree with Kay. I mean, um, coming from technology, uh, you know, I actually ran this talk show for the last uh, 10 years and five years ago, I feel like there was this it was really hard for me to get women in technology on my show. It was a technology-focused show. And about five years ago, there was this huge influx of fashion technology companies, and, um, or fashion tech, if you will. And I attribute, um, honestly, all of the female founders now putting themselves out there in technology to these incredible women in fashion tech, like Jen Hyman from Rent the Runway and Katya from Birchbox um, Beauty Company and um, the Gilt Girls, Alexis Maybank and Alexandra Wilkes -Wilk Wilson. Um, I mean, I attribute all of these people feeling more comfortable because fashion is something that you put yourself out there and, um, and now we have incredible fashion tech companies like you two with Finery putting yourself out there. And I'm seeing such change. But also, if you look at fashion schools or like the major fashion schools, about 90% of graduates are female. And so I think we're going to see even more there. So it is an innovative space and it's changing, like Kay said, I think. You know, uh, Jessa, you're absolutely right. And we're seeing, I, really, women know a lot more about fashion, what we want, when we want it, how we want it. Delivered. We know a lot more about it in the world that's changing today, where um, you know it's online is really uh, the connector for um, people who are influencers, people who are starting new brands. But also, I think that the DNA of using technology is also very familiar to women, because in the media business, where I originally come from, um, the, you know. At the time that it was a more of a closed environment, it was all men when I was in it, uh, except for me. And they were, you know, it wasn't so open. Today it's totally open and anybody can access and anybody can start a brand online and anybody. And I think women are actually much more facile with the technology side than they used to be. And we can talk a little bit about New York Te Fashion Tech Lab too and what we're doing there and what those companies are doing later on. But I think we have some other things I, that you want to hit first. I, I think that sounds incredibly hopeful. Yeah. But not to be a total um, <laughs> nihilist here, it's hopeful, but it's pretty um, abysmal where it is now. Can I play devil's advocate? Yeah, yeah. you I'm always do, Brooke. I always, I'm a devil's advocate. It's a terrible trait. Um, <laughs> If you look at the online digital space and you look at you know, the biggest websites that exist for women, Refinery29 being one of them, uh, Glossy being one of them, a lot of these companies are actually funded and founded by men. So much like if you look at print, okay, so I have this written down. The first women's magazine was published in 1693. And it was a manual that came out weekly for women written by men. They were like, here, this is how you should look. This is how you should live, which is kind of typical, right? And what's so funny about that, that was 1693 in London. It hasn't really changed. Because if you look at the biggest publishers in the country, if you look at the Condé Nast, the Hearst, the Time Inc., there are 35 leadership positions in those three conglomerates. Seven of them are held by women, right? And these are the people who are giving us the glamours, the L's, the, uh, the good housekeeping, uh, Vogue. And, and granted, you know, women are editing them, women are buying them, women are reading them, advertisers are paying top dollar so that women will continue, again, purchasing their items in these magazines, but they're, they're run by men. And how does that change? It's like we're buying everything, 
and we're buying all the fashion, we're buying all the fashion magazines. We're editing, we're doing the hard work, we're putting out the product. <laughs> but we're not making money off of it. Well, it, and that gets down to financing, mm -hmm. which is a tough road yet yeah. Yeah. for women launching businesses in, in uh, media and in fashion. It's still uh, a tougher road for women, but actually women are starting to really learn to love the finance part of the business. That's the part that really, is. that's what the business part is. And you know, learning that is, is part of really growing up in a business, and I think that that's the part that really has to be developed more aggressively, and we need more women investing in women-led businesses as well. Well, that's why we have you too. Yeah. I mean, it really is fascinating, seven to 11% of the partners, those are the people who make the decisions in the VCs, the seven to 11% of them are women. And, and that's, a, I mean, it's just, it's astonishing. We have some unbelievable stats here, but we started looking through these websites. Like, okay, let's, I was, Brooklyn and I went out looking for funding and I said, the first thing we're gonna do is find, com, find VCs that are, have women partners. Oh, wow. That was like an that's actually um, I actually know what study that came from, and that's actually a wrong. Uh, it's wrong because I went through all of the part of the um, funds, and they would put like an associate, like if it's partners, like they would mm -hmm. put like an associate who is a woman, or even like someone um, less. who's at the reception desk. Yeah, oh. so it's actually significantly less than that. It's somewhere between like four and. Or that's, it's probably. funny because that's what one of the female partners at this PE said to me, private equity group said. She said, okay, yeah, Whitney, it may say 7, 11%, but um, about 3% of us actually can make decisions. Yeah. And I well, you have to be on the investment committee. You have to be, a, a, you know, somebody that's on the investment committee so yeah. that you can bring, how it works is that you have to promote the companies that you want to invest in and you have to take them to the investment committee and you have to get the other people on the investment committee to vote for your you know, company that you're bringing to the table. Yeah. And if you don't have someone, if this who you're talking to isn't at the table, they're not getting you anywhere because they can't you know, really promote you to be funded. That's what happens. Brooke and I know this, I mean. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, just a little anecdote that we found sort of sad, but also very funny is that when we were going around and talking about finery, for example, um, men who didn't really understand why women would want to have, you know, a catalog system for their wardrobe would say, well, let me just, I'll ask my wife what she thinks about it. So they're going home to their wife who, who, who might or might not have any knowledge of the marketplace or might or might not like a website or might or might not shop online. And they're leaving it up to them to decide what products are actually making it to market. I mean, these huge decisions, deciding whether or not our business makes it or does not or gets funding or does not, it's decided upon by whether that guy feels like his wife might use it. And yeah, that's like, like me walking out and just being like, uh, you, right there. Right. Hey, what do you think, do you think about this? Do you think this is gonna make it? Can you fund our company? Would you fund this company? And okay, if you awesome. say no, we're dead Yeah, in the water. done, sorry. That's no it. funding for you. <laughs> that's I'm, so cool. And I think, you know, it's like when you have conversations like this, you do, you don't wanna, you know, I don't, I always get on my soapbox and I'm like, women, yeah. Like, um, but I think it's so important to realize that we need men to help us too. Like I have incredible male investors in my fund. I've had incredible men champion me and um, women don't have as much access to capital. And I think to change this problem, um, women need more access to capital and they need more access to capital at an early stage. And that means more females need to be running the money. And I feel like with Halogen Ventures, I try to help with that in a couple ways. But one, I make all of my founders promise that they'll sell the company for a billion dollars, because <laughs> that's the dream. And then that they will invest part of that back into the ecosystem, because that's, that's like quick access to capital. You know, you have like Cindy Whitehead, who sold her company for $1.5 billion last year. Um, she created the first female sex drug. There's 12 male sex drugs on the market, and she got the first female one through the FDA approval. Um, Valiant uh, launched it, hasn't launched it yet, but um, she's you know she's pioneering like a whole new industry. You have the Gilt Girls who sold a company for 250 million. You have Alexa von Tobel who sold a company for 250 million to Northwestern Mutual. It was a um, fintech company. So I'm not taught like this is in every industry. Women are like having great exits, which is great, and we need to give women in all industries more access to capital. All of those women are investing it back in. Um, a lot of them are actually my investors as well. And they, um, I think that's, that's what we need to do. And then also like 
more women starting funds. Like I, I'm, um, you know, Kay and I, this is like the biggest barrier to entry to go raise a fund. <laughs> and it's hard enough to raise a fund, let alone to like be a woman raising a fund um, that's investing in women. It's because men run all of the money. Um, so we need, we need all of you wonderful men out there championing this as well. Well, let me uh, just bring a little perspective and time uh, to the discussion because I think it's important. At Springboard Enterprises, which is a uh, venture catalyst that we launched in 1999 when we saw all this money pouring over the transom and no women getting it, we were for, I was focused on women in technology and life sciences. Of course, technology was across today many, many different sectors. But um, it was quite an amazing experience to go out and find companies. And actually, when we did a call out for companies, we were hoping to get maybe 100 so we could find 10 that we could present in a demo day to the venture capital community in Silicon Valley, because we knew it would, they would be you know, critical. Uh, no one thought women were going to build these scalable companies. Um, and uh, we got 350 applications, two thirds of which were technology, one third in life sciences like biotech and devices and diagnostics. And we presented them on January 27, 2000 at the Oracle Conference Center. And I got to tell you, people came, and like 300 more or more people came uh, during the day to see these presentations. And of course, coming from the media, I knew it would be showtime. These people really had to show well in order to be interesting to invest in. 22 got funded. 22 of the 26 got funded. Two merged their business. One woman sold their business, and one wasn't funded. And we've been doing this ever since. So we've brought like now 652 companies through our program. And they're all female run. And they're all female run companies. All She's of them are such female a badass. run. Mm -hmm. And you know some of them because uh, there's Helen Greiner from right. iRobot with the Zoom, you know, the uh, robotic vacuum cleaner, and uh, Gail Goodman from Constant Contact. Uh, Robin Chase from Zipcar. These are all public companies, companies that went public. Uh, some of you might go to you know, things like uh, Minute Clinic, uh, which is part of CVS. I mean, many, many, uh, over $7.5 billion has been raised for these companies since 2000. And so 2000. investing in women makes so you money. It makes money <laughs> oh, it for does. people. And, and now Fashion Tech Labs started and more diverse in its fourth year in New York in combining this industry yeah. with raising the funding for it and really teaching you know, people how to go out and raise funding for it. So I never thought it would take quite this long, uh, but you know, we're it's- getting there. It, we're, well, no, we're gonna change it, but we have to have more women investing. Does that yeah. win it? There's a very, very interesting study out by Sahil um, uh, from, he's now at uh, Alberta University, but uh, he did it when he was at Penn, and it was this research study on why women don't get, as much, get so much money when they go after funding. And he just didn't want to have the typical answer like, well, women aren't competitive enough, and they don't have a big enough vision, and they aren't reaching high enough, and all people say things like this about women, yeah. which is, of course, we don't believe is true. But what he found was when men invested in men, they have a 40% chance of having a positive liquidity event, but when an all-men venture invests in women, she has a 15% chance of having a liquidity event. However, when women invest in women, she has a 40% chance. And so what his title of his article at Harvard Business Review is, when women invest in women, the gender gap disappears. So that kind of summarizes why we need more women out there investing, I think. That's pretty amazing. It's so funny, because I read that in Jesse's deck. <laughs> and I love that. I was like, oh, yes, OK, so Jesse's investing in women, and those women are going to kick ass. Yeah. Um, another thing that, like, getting, so we, we know women need to get the capital, and we know we need to invest in women now. But then um, there's some other solutions out there that have been floating around that um, Brooklyn and I sort of thought were a little bit wonky. And I think we need to just discredit them or understand them. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting is that we have all these influencers and bloggers. The wonderful thing about it is there are mostly women out of the top 20 in this group right here. There's only one man. So we're trying to think of ways that besides just access to capital that we can kind of um, reverse engineer this and come back in as winners. So uh, this is where Brooklyn and I always have these discussions because 
Brooklyn is not an influencer. I mean, she has influence. She's a celebrity and one of the smartest ones out there. She never says that she is, but she is. TBD, and, TBD. And so it's really, to, to see these, these young women doing this is great. Out of, there's seven of them that are running their own companies and now, which is great. have their own clothing great. lines, which is incredible. Right. Um, and they're doing very well. And collectively, they have hundreds of millions of followers, which is, again, incredible. And, and nowadays, it, you know, directly correlates to money. Um, but the, the problem is, is that I think we've blurred the lines between consumerism and fashion technology, or just technology in general. And I think a lot of these influencers, because they're in the digital space, um, are, are, are given credit as, as people that are sort of paving the way in fashion technology. But when you look at their Snapchats, as you can see, um, or, or their Instagrams, it's a lot of opening packages, opening free gifts, buying more, selling more, selling to their followers. And, and, and I see why they do it, right? Because, you know, that's, that's how they make their income. You know, they get these, these uh, affiliate link uh, payouts. And so it makes absolute sense. But I feel like we've blurred the line so much between consumerism and technology that now most technology, I don't want to obviously, uh, you know, uh, generalize too much, but I feel like most technology geared towards women is 100% about consumerism and less about services. When you look at technology geared towards men, um, it, typically it's services? How do we make their life more efficient? How do we make, you know, applying for colleges more efficient? How do we make getting jobs easier? Um, and for women, it's about how do we sell them more? And unfortunately, I feel like uh, this, this sort of influencer space, this blogger space, um, while it can be very powerful, I don't think it's being utilized correctly because it's just perpetuating consumerism. And also, it's incredibly exclusive, right? You have these, the normal girl who's who's following these influencers and bloggers, and, and she's made to feel like she's not getting a free lip kit from NARS or a free bag from Fendi or you know whatever it is up on, on the video and, and and so it's like how do we how do we merge that? How do we merge this great influence and this this massive following and 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 combine it with fashion technology and actually create real progress for women and create real services for women that's just not about like we want selling, these selling. women to come out of this and be the next CEOs of Zara and, and H and M. Which they're, they can be. They're starting be. their own companies. Exactly. So it's great. But like let's, it's almost like you know how Kim K came out and she was a celebrity for doing a reality show, but then she started making products. Okay, like you can say whatever. I'm sure my husband's in here. Like, oh god, not Kim Kardashian. <laughs> she is a businesswoman. Yeah, yeah oh, she's definitely. she's yes. she's making an empire. Yep. And Jessica Simpson did the same. You will not probably even people don't, probably don't even know Jessica Simpson was a singer. Right. Now that she has this billion dollar clothing industry. But I think what Brooke is trying to... She was to... brilliant in Dukes of Hazzard. It's, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yes. I actually stand by that statement. I loved her. <laughs> no, but, but there is this, you know, this, this, this sort of blurred line between consumerism and technology. And of course, you can use technology to sell, but, but how do you differentiate the two? Or how do you optimize yeah. technology, not just for... This one I'm going to toss to Jesse, because honestly, this is the most crazy. After that asinine, the... the, the, the the influencer is going to be the one that we have to have as the CEO, which is great. The other crazy uh, solution to this was, <laughs> this is insane, that if you just stop women from shopping, that they can make the, up the, pay, the wage gap. If we just stop buying clothes, what? then we can make up the wage gap. It's <laughs> absolutely ludicrous. Like This is the most ridiculous thing I've heard, but it's out there. So um, we just thought we would debunk it right here, and we have two women up here who can do it, and, and Jesse is like, this is ridiculous. But let's say the average salary of a female millennial is this, and then a male is 35. Women typically spend 2,000 on clothes. Male, this is all done research from um, Finery. Males spend about 1,200. I'm sorry, but it's just not gonna happen. Mathematically, you will not be able to, to, to just bridge that gap. So. I really think th that Jesse, this would be interesting for you to just speak to, like, you know. Well, I just have to say, like, I'm so impressed with um, what you guys are doing at Finery, and I don't know if you gave them a, a little bite-sized piece. You should tell them what you're working on because it's so, you know, I see a lot of celebrity companies, and um, this company is incredible because um, Brooklyn hasn't like just put herself like started working on another fashion company. This is like I was telling her backstage. 
this is a data company. This is a fashion data company. Like these are legit founders. I'm so impressed with what they're doing. They're like reverse engineering fashion and it's absolutely incredible. Um, I, you guys should tell them what you're working on because it's very cool if you haven't already. We're, I love we're, that I'm plugging, I'm not invested in their company, <laughs> but like for real. I swore to them this was not gonna be a panel about finery, but I'm oh, just, sorry. what we're doing is we're really trying to reduce consumerism and women only wear 20% of their wardrobe. So we're trying to basically give you your wardrobe, a virtual wardrobe that is easy to access, that is automated that you can open up anywhere. Brooke calls it the, your wardrobe in your pocket, wherever you are, um, and, and be able to actually wear the clothes you already have, and then shop strategically for clothes you need. Like we'll say, oh, you already have a black turtleneck. Are you sure you wanna buy that? Wouldn't it be amazing if you just had this little guy? Are you sure you wanna buy that? <laughs> That's kind of what we're gonna do for you. So when you put something in your wish list, we can then um, cross it with the stuff that you actually own. Um, because we know what you own. Think of it as like a Spotify for your wardrobe. You can make your playlists, but it's really wardrobes. You can see what you've purchased in the last 10 years. You can make your wish list and what you want to buy. You can combine it. And again, it's not about selling to females. It's about giving you your time back so you're not wasting time just rummaging through your closet looking for something. And Brooklyn always there. says, what is this, witchcraft? How do we, witchcraft. How we get, whenever somebody asks us, well, how do you get the stuff in the closet? It's witchcraft. It's witchcraft. <laughs> it's witchcraft. According to Brooklyn. Magic. But, but anyway, so yes, we are trying to sell you less, but not for this reason. Not for the reason that we think right. that if we sell you if, you, if you buy less, that you're gonna actually, no, the wage gap needs to be fixed, period. And Kay was actually working on that with President Clinton um, back in the 90s, which is like, you saw it early. You saw women weren't getting capital, but also women weren't making money. Well, I, back then, I don't think women were thinking big enough, to be honest with you, to really attract the kind of money that we're talking about today to fuel businesses that really have high growth aperture. I mean, we, we, what we do, we focus totally on company, entrepreneurs that, who are women, entrepreneurs who we think really can build a scalable and sustainable business. Those are the businesses people want to put their capital into. And so it's really... I think it is really creating the whole ecosystem. It's not just about the entrepreneur and the capital. It's about the attorneys, the accountants. It's about the corporate partnerships. It's about building partnerships. It's about marketing. It's about, it's about the whole, board members. It's about the whole package that you really have to access. And, and I think that that's, that's certainly what we're building uh, at Springboard and Springboard Growth Capital. That's what we're building, uh, you know, this, the, the entire ecosystem. And we have over 4,000 experts in different areas of technology and life sciences that can uh, advise companies. And, and I think that's what women were lacking. Women were lacking, not that men were not available, but they really didn't believe we were gonna do something that was scalable and sustainable. Then we have a number of businesses that are in excess of a billion dollar valuation from Springboard. So we, you know, we know what we're doing on sort of scaling. Now we just have to have those people come back work with the people coming behind them, invest in the people coming behind them, just as Jessie was saying before, her, and, you know, her companies are doing, her founders are doing. We're creating an ecosystem that will understand who we are, what we're doing, what we're developing, and not have people you know, immediately start working on their smartphones 30 seconds after you get into the room because they, you know, they think, oh, well, oh. I don't know about this and I don't go shopping and I don't really care about these consumer products and I don't care about this technology. And my wife isn't here to ask. Yeah, so. right, I, but I will go home and ask her. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it is, the, her, the wife may be a perfectly intelligent, right. wonderful course, shopper, right. but course, shouldn't be making about the that. decision no, 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 about right. whether right. they should invest and in our company. There's great exactly. stories about um, women getting <laughs> being very creative with pitching um, men uh, VCs. There's, um, I actually just read this story somewhere I was reading. Oh, Julia Pimsler's book called Women Move. What's that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Women, uh, Million Dollar Women. Women? Uh, million women Dollar Women. Millions. You mean that? Uh, no, no, no. Oh. Million Dollar Women. It's a great book you should read. It's called, it's by Julia Pimsler. She started Little Pim, which was, uh, she had a big exit. It's like a um, language learning oh. company uh, for kids. And she told this great story about um, Bobble Bar and how the girls of Bobble Bar would actually like ship their jewelry 
to, it's a jewelry company, they would ship their jewelry weeks in advance to the um, receptionists at all of the um, venture capital funds. And so then when they went in, they were always wearing the jewelry. And so they'd say, yeah, like, yeah, it's so weird. Your receptionist is wearing <laughs> the jewelry. Hey, that's and amazing. So, that's really good. So they would bring them in and then, um, the uh, the VCs would say, oh, well, our receptionists oh, would be liking it. But I mean, the fact we have to get that creative is so crazy. So basically, we need to target all the receptionists and get them to sign up for Finery I so like that. that we can, okay, that's Exactly, right. yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, well, I do think that, you know, we were talking a little bit before about um, the influencers, and there is something about people's ability to influence others or become their own personalities, but there's also the danger of, you know, depending on an influencer because something could happen to that influencer they could do something that was you know not acceptable yeah. to your brand i mean mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. your brand exactly and you have to be very careful about how the brand is is so you might a lot of people are using influencers big brands are using influencers today revolve is made yeah. by influencers yeah revolve Right. I mean, they, the two men who started Revolve, it's almost, it's getting its way to being a billion dollar company. They do influencers the best. I mean, they crush it. They have these huge parties in the Hamptons with all these influencers and everybody's out there. And I'm just sitting there wondering like, wait a minute, what all of this money that is being spent, I wish we could, Revolve would then take rather than like doing these big parties and say, you know what, what about other, fa like they carry multi-labels. How about they give money mm -hmm. to different females that are designers that could then be carried in their store? I mean, I'm sure those guys are incredibly sensible. They're very smart. And they took a long time, Revolve took a long time to become they're a they're starting to do that. They're starting to seed money into the influencers that, are, that they're using, which is great. Yes. But we need more of that. And I'm curious how that converts to sales too. Like I have, an, I have a couple companies that work with influencers and I'm always like, track how this converts. Like how, how much are you selling through that influencer and then use the best ones? But it's, it's hard to track through an Instagram post unless they actually use the referral link and sometimes they don't. Right. And actually Brooklyn, I'd be curious, you know, I, I see a lot of celebrity oriented companies and um, one of the problems I have as an early stage investor is um, I work with all the talent agencies and I've had to explain to their um, brand departments how like an equity deal works with, um, with a celebrity. And celebrities don't typically understand anything other than a cash check. And I'm constantly saying, okay, no, but if you owned a piece of, in of Instagram and it sold mm -hmm. to Facebook for like billions of dollars, yep. you, I can't remember how much it was, like $2 billion, something like $3 billion, um, you would have millions of dollars from that sale. And so it's a long-term play, but how do you recommend getting, p teaming up, you know, celebrities with it's the, the problem is it's a long-term play. The problem is that it's a long-term play. And I think now when you look at influencers and celebrities, as we've seen, unless you are a massive star, I think the turnover is so quick these days just yeah. because that's the pace at which we promote people and then take them down. That's just the nature of sort of the, the celebrity these days. And so I think because of that, people have the mentality of like, let's strike while the iron's hot. You rarely see longevity unless it's like a Jennifer Lawrence, right? Um, and as far as like young Hollywood is concerned. And so, or, or in the blogosphere with influencers. Um, I, you know, I've, I've seen those deal, I've, you know, my manager and I are very close and I've seen deals come through him to other clients and if there's no payout with equity, they won't do it. But what's interesting now is that Wait, pay out, like cash payout. Cash and equity. And equity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They won't do it. Okay. And what's funny now is that instead of taking only cash, now a lot of them are demanding cash and equity, equity to a company who never wanted to give them equity. Well, and the problem with early stage is like they don't have that money. Like, exactly. To pay a yeah, celebrity we don't have a money large check. Pay. Um, they don't even have, I've like done things on, you know, the Katie Kirk show or whatever, and they're like, we need 500 of these to give to the audience. And I'm like, this is an early stage company. We can't afford yeah. to They can't that do that, right. that, you have to pay yes. for it. <laughs> and as Kay was saying, it's a risk for a company to do because essentially you're making this influencer a lifetime partner and you hope that they keep and up like with the Kay standards said, that your company You're hoping set. they stay, That's exactly you know, right. they don't like in accordance Lance with Armstrong whatever. that. Ooh. Just saying. Sorry, I totally like, <laughs> took it to <laughs> another place. No, but that's true. It's, it's a really, it's a good point. You know, there, it's kind of interesting the confluence of media and in fashion, I mean, there really there are a lot of similarities to the mm -hmm. two businesses, and have, having been in both of them for decades, I, I, you know, I see them. But 
fundamentally in the business, you really have today, you really have to hit the metrics of the business really clearly. You have to know what are the competitive metrics in your business. And besides your great product or service that you're selling, you really have to know what others are doing, what the competition is. So you have to know what your margins are. You have to know what your revenue streams are. You have to really, you have to, you have to be very granular today. It's not just, you know, when early on in the media business when MTV started off as cops on bikes, you know, or <laughs> doing something like that, you know. It could be simple, but it was just, uh, you know, it, it, today you really have to be granular about the numbers uh, but, in the business. But, but and that's what has that. been. Yeah? This is where you sit with a, like a big time entrepreneur who's made it and they talk to you about your idea and they want an angel CD. Yeah. They are not asking you, okay, what are the revenue streams? They are not asking you that. They see the big picture and they say, I, I get you're going to get a lot of people. We'll figure out how to make money off of this. But this is going to, let's talk about getting users. Well, to get angel money, you don't have to have the numbers because none of the numbers are going to be right. And when you're just, you're not when you're just a concept, yeah. that, that's true. I mean, to get your first angel investors and so forth, they're, they know the numbers, whatever you present for numbers. You know, they know are going to change. I'm talking about as you go up the ladder and really try to scale your business, that's when you really have to okay. have them. When you're raising a Series A, you really do have to start to have numbers. And beyond that, you definitely really have to know. And, and I think that that is part that we need to bring more of that to the fashion business, to the media businesses that are starting up today. And there are a lot of women on the technology side of the retail businesses, not the designer. But technology, so like we have companies that are like Smartser that you know, can look at a video of uh, you know, anything and say, oh, I like that, and you just snap and you can find out, oh, where could I buy that? And a whole bunch of options come up to you or a company like Claire that can tell a, a company what people are gonna buy before they actually produce it. There's a lot of predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. I think some of the big companies that you're gonna see that women are behind are companies like this, mm -hmm. in addition to the design side of it. And, and if you're a data-driven company like you are, are starting, that's what's really gonna be the driver of your valuation. Yes, yeah. I feel like, and it, what's just, what's really interesting, we've been um, meeting with a lot of these big giant companies and we we're saying to them, oh, like, we have this unbelievable data. Like we, everybody is, we can go back 10 years into your buying and know exactly what you've purchased. Wouldn't you want to know that data? And they're these big fashion companies and they don't know what to do with data. So it's like, yes, we are creating a great um, value add, but they don't have the data science teams yet to use it. That's true. So Most of them don't. It's and, very, and, they're, it's, and they're looking for the startups to bring it to them. Yes. So, they really are. That is absolutely true. But one, one thing, I just wanted to um, move this a little bit forward from that. Like, okay, you, you try to study trends when you're looking to invest in, in companies. And so there was the trend, of course, that you would just basically find some smart white guy who just dropped out of an Ivy League school, Exhibit A, and, um, and then you'd invest in them, and boom, there you have a success. Facebook, Dell, Microsoft, all of those. Okay, well, now, like Jesse mentioned at the very beginning, women are graduating at higher rates than men, women are going to college at higher rates than men. That is not a pattern anymore. I mean, women are not gonna drop out of college, especially an Ivy League one, and then especially they will not be funded if they don't go to Harvard or one of these, I mean, most of them have. Yeah. So uh, that's not a pattern. What is a pattern that we, can, that we can use now? Like, let's say there's an entrepreneur in the audience right here and they're saying, okay, I wanna be a fashion entrepreneur. The pattern, which you sort of hinted at at the beginning, and you also told me about, Kay, is to in data invest in technology. Be a fashion technology company. Mm -hmm. If you want to get into fashion, you need to get into fashion technology. And I think the, the women that you talked about at the beginning, if we could show them, they are the women that are leading. We need to look to them. These are the women that are leading fashion technology. We just threw us on there because, you know. 
Why not? Why well, not? good. It's launching That's this month. That's hilarious. Yes, we are launching, <laughs> launching this, month. this month. What is it? But March 23rd? Is yes, that the March date? 23rd, March 23rd. We actually launched. Be the, alert. Watch for it. The, <laughs> these women are taking, they're not just like what, Brooke, you can speak to this about consumerism versus taking a company and actually giving women a service. Like these are all service-based companies. They're not just selling you more stuff. I don't think we have enough services for women. I mean, we're getting there, of course, but I, but I do, I have to I, be honest, it has been a, a pet peeve of mine that, that people believe that fashion technology uh, is just synonymous with selling more product to women. Um, and, that, and that a lot of people think that's enough, that, that, that women don't need a service or don't want a service or don't understand why we would use a service. Um, and so it's exciting to see women actually creating companies Companies, um, and providing services that are making lives of, of, of working women, of non-working women, easier and more efficient. So how did these women do it? Well, I can talk about the real real because I'm an investor. Uh, Springboard Gross Capital is an investor. Mic drop. And, and uh, that's a luxury um, consignment company, the largest online consignment company um, with luxury, great luxury brands. But when it's about $400 million revenue company at present time and growing rapidly, but it's it's really how they put together from the experience of a very experienced team in um, in the consumer products businesses, and um, this is Julie's third company, Julie Wainwright, who's pictured there, is the founder and CEO, and when you look at their business, it's really heavily driven on, you know, what are the cost factor of getting the products out of people's closets? You're talking about what's in people's closets. This is getting the Birkin bag out of people's closets. And, and that's their biggest expense, it. right, is the acquisition. Yeah, of and so how much does it cost, how much does it cost, you know, to the nth degree, how much does it cost to get that product? Um, how much does it cost to get the buyer of the product? How much, what are the margins? What does it take to authenticate each piece of each article that comes in and driven down to how much does it cost to photograph the product so it's per, you know photographed properly on the website but it's in very very minute detail as to what makes that business work and you have to all these women in picture there know how to do that I mean Stitch Fix also has to do that you know knows what it's business to scale a business and really make it so someday it will be among the Fortune 500 companies. <laughs> you, you really have to pay attention to what it really costs to run that business. What does your product cost you? What does your delivery cost you? What is your marketing down to the nth degree? But it's exciting that women are doing it right. today. Yeah. And, and that's what's exciting, thing, and a lot of women can share it with others. That's what's really exciting. I, one thing, it's like created by women for women to use yeah. by women, and it's technology. But one thing that you mentioned earlier, and I think Jesse does this better than any woman I have ever met. Oh, stop. She, <laughs> she connects women, and I mean no joke. Like this woman, right I meet away. her. We talk 30 minutes. I said, she said, is there somebody you want to meet? I said, yeah, I want to meet Jen Hyman. I rent the runway. All right, writes an email right there. Hey, you need to meet Jen. Set up a meeting. Next week we had a meeting. Brooklyn and I walk in. We sit with the CTO, the CMO, the the, the CAO, mm -hmm. everybody, and Jen who is like nine months pregnant, yes. almost having the baby on the table we were sitting. She might be delivering right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, she's delivering. Well, and that, that, and that's, that's the important thing I mean, about that that's ecosystem. That's the important thing for like, yeah. for what Kay, Kay and I both do yeah. that. And I think that's what a lot of female investors do. Like that's what a good investor does is they'll introduce you. But I do find with female founded companies, they don't have this network. I actually just met with a founder of a company called um, Relish. It's like a women's sports media site. And she said, um, I didn't go to Stanford and I didn't work at Google and I just don't have this network. And that's a problem a lot of people starting companies have, but women especially. And so I think part of what you do as an investor is connect. And sometimes I do feel like I'm like introducing, I'm like, I don't know where this is going, but something great is gonna <laughs> happen, you know? And I think it's really important to like, Introductions should be free, and um, you know we're all like, especially all of us up here, we're all kind of like championing the same, the same cause. Right. So the the last sort of thing I wanted to, because um, we need to have some questions here. Um, we have. I, I promised you that I would tell you about why these three things that I randomly showed you at the beginning. Um, were relevant to this conversation. So Cinderella and the glass slipper, um, not just so that we can get married. 
it is actually relevant because a fairy godmother, she like comes in, bam, saves the day, gives you the dress. That's our modern day Jen Hyman. She comes, she dresses you for your events, and now she's got a new subscription service where she's dressing women to go get ready for work. And I love this about this, you can, you can rent three things unlimited, it's like an unlimited closet. And I'm not, I don't make any money off of Rent the Runway. I just think this is an amazing service that she's providing. You have endless closet to get dressed to go to work. Um, she has given us a um, um, code that you can use to get 30% off because one of the things we've all learned up here is that the only way that you can really though support women in technology is to use their technology. So. This and Jen would way. tell you that this company is a technology company. That's what she'd definitely mm -hmm. say it is not a fashion company. She'd say it's a technology company. Yes, for sure. And and so then and then the next thing were, was about the bra. All right, this actually is a bra, which is very bizarre. But that the, a woman created this this bra. It was um, patented by a woman, and she ended up having to sell the patent for $1,200, which is $20,000 equivalent to a man, to bring it to market. So um, not bashing men here, I'm just saying that she really did not make a lot of money off of that. But now we have somebody who plans on making some money off of a very awkward situation in an amazing way. Period proof underwear, yes. It's not a bra, it's, it's revolutionary and um, Mickey is doing it, and so uh, Brooklyn has connected with her, and they have given us an amazing um, discount code that you guys can go and get all of your period-proof underwear. They crushed this um, ad campaign on the New York subway. A New York Transit wouldn't let them put up this ad because of the word period, and then they became like rock stars, which is awesome. And then the last thing, Wonder Woman, um, she, she actually, yeah, there she is. She, the comic book version of her was created by a man. Linda Carta made it famous. The guy actually was the guy who created the lie detector test, which is interesting because she has that lasso, you know, where the lie lasso. Um, but if you want to give up your Wonder Woman suit and sell it, you can sell it on the real real. <laughs> and um, they're giving you $100 off your first purchase. So this is why I'm saying like, you've got to support the women that are doing these things because we don't want it to be the situation of before where women created these things, but then men profited off of them. These women are doing great things in serving other women and we need to support them. Um, so I'm opening this up to questions now just so that we can, you guys can pepper the questions. Again, um, you can go to slide, what is it? Slide something? Um, oh, there it is. Slido. Ta -da! Slido, yes. And enter South by South. So here we say, okay, first question right here. Um, on influencers, what can people in marketing and agencies do to help change the story from consumerism to something more helpful for the cause? And I think Brooke, you can speak to that. Look at her, she's happy. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, again, I, I just hate the, the, the constant uh, comparison, the, just the, the, the idea that women need a technology to sell them more. Um, I mean, I think what brands can do, it all depends on the brand, of course, but, you know, I, I think uh, the, what is so good about the last 10, 15, 20 years is that companies really care about their social impact. Um, and I think there's no better way to use a social media influencer or a blogger or whatever it may be than to use them for social impact. So if you're doing a brand, and I think a lot of brands are starting to do this, um, but I, I think if you're making a, a campaign about some sort of social impact, I think your message will spread wider than trying to open a box of NARS lipsticks for your for your users. That's I mean that's my opinion. I, I clearly have a very cynical view on the whole thing, but um, <laughs> well, media, I, I think that uh, Blake Mykowski was a former business partner of mine. Yeah. Uh, brought Tom's shoes to market. Yeah. Probably yeah. the best known and earliest yep. social program marketer, and did a great job, and still doing a great job with yeah. the company. Um, and a lot of people have followed that model, saying, do good, give one way. I mean, Warby Parker's giving away glasses, yep. for example, yeah. These you are know, big to fashion kids brands. who need them. I yep. do have to say, there are some great nonprofits in the world, but I believe in for-profit companies and for-profit giving, where you know it's like the Tom Shoes model, because you can do so much more 
if you are a sustainable company. Um, otherwise, you're going to be fundraising forever. So I think every company should figure out, you know, there's so many great corporations who do this. I think mm -hmm. Salesforce coined the one for one for one, you know, 1% they give away, 1%. Um, I'm going to butcher the whole thing. Um, but uh, I think it's really important. I make sure all of my early stage founders are thinking about how what they create is impacting the community. How are they going to recycle? Um, even if it's a for-profit company, these are things they should be thinking about um, and how they can give. Um, so I think that's a really important thing just in general. Mm -hmm. um, OK, this one's good. Can women only become CEOs of their own companies? How can they climb the ladder in traditional established companies from luxury goods to fashion and beauty? This is a great question. Well, I don't think only that. I mean, Angela Ahrens was the CEO of Burberry, which was, you know, as was a big global market. She, she left that job to go to Apple and runs all the Apple stores um, and marketing uh, now for new products and so forth. But, you know, no, I think they, a company can choose uh, women uh, to take the next role. And I think that the boards of directors and having sat on boards for the last 30 years in the, you know, in all different kinds of businesses, I think that boards of companies have to be exposed to more of the people that are around the C-suite mm -hmm. because that's usually who they choose from, people mm -hmm. that are up in the C-suite already doing business and to have more comfort and co um, confidence uh, in women rising to that slot. Oddly enough, look at the biggest technology companies run by women, IBM, HP, uh, you know, you can go, you know, there are yeah. quite a few of them that are the heavy, biggest technology companies, some of our aerospace, Lockheed Martin, I mean, it's unbelievable. So, so fashion the, just needs to wake up a little bit. I, I mean, mean I, th I, I think, you know, I think a lot it's of about, the, it's about who sits up, on I the mean. board. So you look on the boards of those 15 companies that you're mm -hmm. talking about, I'll bet you that those boards are very few women on those boards. So to yeah. Jesse's point, we need to start sending them jewelry ahead of time? Yeah, <laughs> totally. You've got to get creative. But I think or in any corporation, yeah. it doesn't matter what industry, you identify kind of the path, make sure like your position in the company currently, you can find that vertical movement. And if not, force yourself into the room. Say, hey, can I sit in on this meeting? I think it's, Kay is right. Like it's all about that FaceTime. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Paula Sutter is a great example though. She was CEO of Diane von Furstenberg for 14, 14. years. When that company went public, she was not the one <laughs> that they chose to have so. go public. And that's just what, this person who asked that question, it's very hard to, to be able to, in fashion, to be able to be the one that takes your company public. But let's go, let's go. Um, where Wait. did I get this amazing jumpsuit? <laughs> <laughs> very groundbreaking question, Krista. And by the way, if you notice, there's a banana up here. It's a banana. Um, yeah, I, I am a consumer. I bought this jumpsuit on, um, oh, I bought it on uh, Avenue 32. It's like a cool multi-label website. I only purchase everything online. But um, anyway, let's move on. What are some <laughs> of the upcoming, up and coming women founders that you are closely interested on, in incurring advising? These are the up and comers, not the ones that are already there. Ed, what do you guys think? In this space? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, we just uh, have concluded our fourth year of Fashion Tech uh, Lab, and we have a lot of companies coming out of it. But you know, they're, they may not be designers like you know, you're wearing uh, that from it's people that are in predictive analytics like Trendal uh, Trendalytics and Style Sage and companies like this that are coming uh, into the marketplace. Um, Markable is an unbelievably creative company that, as I said, can really take any video, can watch a television show, movie, anything, and anything, any product that's on there, they can immediately tell you where to get that product, they can connect you with buying the product, and they can give you choices on different price ranges that are similar to that product. And it's an, um, these amazing things are coming to market that, that I think women are driving, because women know how women use technology mm -hmm. to do their shopping. You shop only online, you said. Yeah. But you know, people go online and in-store and Omnimedia and payments, I mean, all mobile payments. I mean, there's a lot of companies in these different areas. So those are a couple that are, are you know, starting to come to market that are, uh, yeah, I think, quite remarkable, and that we have many more. 
Yeah. What about this one for Jesse? Because do you think women could do more to help each other, to insist women have a seat at the decision-making table? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I bring my assistant, who's a female, into meetings with me because I want her to get that exposure. Like, I think it's so important, too. Um, you can definitely do more to support each other. And I think men can do more, too. You know, you guys have a seat at the table. You play on the golf course. Um, you know, you, you get these deals done. Like, throw a, women, a woman in there. Like, she'll surprise you and also more diverse teams and more diverse ideas. I mean, the, the data is there. Like, this creates great companies. It's interesting because we have, like, sort of all different, being from media, and then it's tough. I mean, Brooke, you work on a show with Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda. These, I mean, Jane Fonda is known as these They're iconic class feminists. Yeah. Yes. And so, I mean, you are there every day where women could be helping women, and it's it's a tough thing to do in in Hollywood. In I'm media. working in a very unusual show, very unusual posi position where our 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 showrunner is a female. Um, our writers are predominantly females. Our leads are females. Um, but I think they're, I mean, now we have with the rise of the Amy Polars, um, uh, the Amy Schumers, Tina Fey, who are producing all this content, even Kelly Oxford, who's an author and writer and creating content for women, I think we're making huge strides in Hollywood. I think actually even more than technology as it is regarded to fashion. Um, but yes, I am very lucky to be working in a really unique uh, situation where I'm surrounded by women who are supporting each other and writing for each other. So we have it at least in uh, we on have your it show. And we're getting it and it, we're getting Netflix, there and right. we're getting there in Hollywood. Um, let's yeah. see. How about this? Uh, how can creative control over fashion houses and brands translate to more financial control? Who wants to take this? Creative control over. Fashion. See, this is a, I, I'm actually really curious to hear this question because again, I think it goes back to the publications where you look at who's actually publishing and who's on the executive boards of these massive publishing companies in the United States, and they're all men, but the editors are females. The females are creating the content, yet they're not making the money off of the sales of the magazines, like the publishing, like the publishers are. So I, I, I mean, want to know the answer to that question. I think we just need more women in finance. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just a general, and like the, you know, again, the data is there. There was this great article you guys should read. I think it was in Forbes recently that came out, and uh, Kay and I do venture investing, but, um, but it was all about how the top performing hedge funds are all run by women. Um, that just came out a couple of days ago, and that was awesome, because that is like all men. <laughs> like completely male dominated and that's like the big money and I'm like, we will get there. <laughs> um, but that's really exciting. So I think it's just about getting more women interested in finance. And honestly, what I would say to that is um, getting involved in investing and finance is such a fun, emotional thing. Like I make, it's like betting for a living. Like I'm betting on really incredible people who have a crazy out there idea. Like I just invested in a girl who, um, it's called Dog Parker, and it's a dog house on the street, on the sidewalk outside um, stores in New York. And it's like, you check your dog in. Like, it's just this crazy idea, and we have to change so much behavior, but I love it. It's just insane. And I'm betting on this amazing woman running this, like, connected dog house, you know? Like, this is, uh, finance is really fun. <laughs> Question for you, do you put more value, sorry, a little tangent, do you put more value in the people who are starting the companies or the idea as an um, investor? At early stage, I think it's all about the people, but um, because I can plug them in, I sometimes I have to bring on a lawyer or I'm like, um, that's illegal, so you can't do that. <laughs> no, you can't have an article about your company, how your company is fundraising, that's illegal. Um, and so, you, you know, these guys have never run companies sometimes, and and so it's important to uh, support them, bring in an accountant, um, just make sure all the pieces are there. And that's what good investors do is bring that and the network. And that's what table. Kay's doing. Right. And Kay Kay's, is yes. literally teaching women how to get money. Right. She's yes. saying we need to get money. 17 years worth, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty amazing. I mean, I'm yeah. like, OK, I'm going to yeah. sign up for Kay's next yeah. class. Yeah. Get, well, how it, do we get yes. money? Springboard. It, 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 it really is learning a different language because if until you've gone out there to raise money for the first time, why would you know really exactly how the language works? I mean, we have people in biotech, they, they're scientists, they've been in a lab developing oh. drugs. I mean, why would they know exactly. how to raise money? They wouldn't, and they have to learn the language. And it's the same thing for uh, you know, the, the retail businesses. There are a lot of women running large divisions of big retail companies. 
they have the opportunity to really learn about the financial metrics behind it. Now, can they go out and speak the language? Because when you go out, people want to talk about their product, they mm -hmm. want to talk about what they're offering, but they forget that the investor wants to find out, well, what are you doing? How much money do you need? How are you going to use it? How much money am I going to make if I invest in you? And when am I going to get it back? That's what they want to know. So, so you don't all that know that when you're first starting out. You can't possibly know that. And I totally agree with Jesse. In the very beginning, you invest in people. It's the people that you're investing in. But once it starts going and growing, then you've got to learn all these other disciplines. And then, you know, that's when kind of rubber meets the road. Do you really understand the economics of your business? Yeah, the, and if you don't, you should get a partner who the, the, really the, wants to run the business with you. The, um, one of the anecdotes, lastly, uh, one of the woman who did run Diane von Furstenberg for 14 years, she said to me, I, you know, she got out of um, fashion and she went right into private equity because she's like, I want to learn this lingo. I want to know this. And literally acronyms, her name's Paula Sutter, acronyms. She got a list of acronyms and I'm like, okay, the cost per user acquisition. I mean, she just need, it's just lingo. It's just a bunch of lingo. And so... Well, it's like learning another language for some people, but in, and then you have to know the business sector because each business sector, whether it's FinTech, Fashion Tech, Media Tech, software's fast, biotech, you've got to know the language of the industry too, but you've got, then you just know how to pitch it to someone who wants to raise money, uh, put money into your company when you're raising it. And so, so it's it, all doable. But it's In also, summary, also doable. don't be afraid to ask those questions like about the lingo, because I think uh -huh. it's, it's, it never makes sense to me when someone didn't understand right. what I just said and didn't ask about it. You know, mm -hmm. it's so important to just be brave. You could have like a little financial dictionary, that would be really Yeah. Cool. Um, just in summer, I just want to give the last, we want, we want to, why are all these dudes in my closet was the name of this. Now all of these people have come to see another panel. <laughs> Where um, were you in the beginning? However, they're like, we're here for the next panel. Like, <laughs> we, we basically have said that all these dudes, these dudes are in your closet in fashion labels because there isn't enough capital available for women. Women don't know to talk X's and O's just yet, and that's what we're learning. And the last thing is that we do need to support the women who are in um, fashion and they're coming in through the ranks of technology, which is very cool. So we need to support the women who are, uh, are doing these companies in fashion technology and that's, that's what we're all going to do. That's why we gave you all those discount codes. You guys can start using all of these women's companies. They will love it. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you guys all for being here and thank our panelists. And um, okay. We just hope that you guys learned something. And Kay, by the way, will educate you the rest of the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to her class. Yeah. You guys sign up. We'll all do it together. 